Heart Failure Medications, Part 1, Introduction. Hi everyone, and welcome back to another installment of the Farm Easy Tutor. This lecture series will go over medications used for heart failure. Now for many years, all we can do for a failing heart was to give digoxin and diuretics, as they were the only treatments available at the time. But beginning in the early 1990s, heart failure was looked upon in a new and different way, with the discovery of a neurohormonal effect leading to newer agents being used. Based on several trials, heart failure guidelines now recommend prescribing triple therapy of ACE inhibitors or ARBs, beta blockers, and spironolactone. Now with time, newer agents have been studied that have been found to reduce hospitalizations for heart failure and even reduce the risk of mortality. This includes the development of Secubitrol, a neprilysin inhibitor, and Evaverdine, a drug that slows the sinus node. Currently, exciting new therapeutic advances involving the addition of SGLT2 inhibitors and guanyl cyclase inhibitors to the heart failure treatment algorithm are being investigated to further improve patient outcomes. In this four-part presentation, I will provide a complete review of heart failure treatments, including background information, discussion of established drug therapies, and newer add-on agents associated with reduced hospitalization and mortality. So let's begin with part one. In this four-part series on heart failure medications, we'll start off with an introduction in part one, then move on to traditional drug therapies in part two. Then in part three, we'll talk about add-on agents. And then finally in part four, we'll discuss new drug therapies. Heart failure is defined by the American Heart Association and the American College of Cardiology as a complex clinical syndrome that can result from any structural or functional cardiac disorder that impairs the ability of the ventricle to fill with or eject blood. You can see in this diagram the heart function when it's healthy as blood flows readily to the body. In heart failure, the heart cannot pump blood properly due to weakness or stiffness of the heart muscle, causing symptoms such as decreased energy, troubled breathing, weight gain, and swelling of the legs or abdomen. Heart failure affects an estimated 6.5 million U.S. adults. Over the past three decades, the incidence of heart failure in the United States has continued to increase. This increase reflects an aging population improved survival from myocardial infarction and other cardiovascular diseases, and the increasing prevalence of predisposing risk factors such as diabetes and obesity. It's important to note that heart failure is the leading cause of hospitalization in patients older than 65 years of age, and that the readmission rate can be as high as 35% at 60 days. That means one out of three patients will be readmitted to the hospital for heart failure within two months. In the United States, over 1 million patients are hospitalized annually with heart failure as the primary diagnosis, with an additional 3 million hospitalizations with heart failure listed as a secondary or tertiary diagnosis. The mortality rate of heart failure remains high. Almost 50% of people diagnosed with heart failure will die within five years. That's an important number to remember. 50% of patients will die in five years. Approximate heart failure survival is 90% at one month from diagnosis, 78% at one year, and only 58% at five years. Echocardiography is most often employed to assess left ventricular systolic function. An ejection fraction of less than or equal to 40% indicates impaired left ventricular systolic function. Heart failure has traditionally been broadly subclassified according to the left ventricular ejection fraction, LVEF, into three categories. The first category is heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, or HFPEF, with a left ventricular ejection fraction greater than or equal to 50%. The second group is heart failure with mid-range ejection fraction with an LVEF of 41 to 
The last group, which is the most important group that we'll be talking about, is heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, or HFREF, with a left ventricular ejection fraction less than or equal to 40%. The most important consideration when categorizing heart failure is whether left ventricular ejection fraction, or LVEF, is preserved or reduced. A reduced LVEF in systolic heart failure is a powerful predictor of mortality. 50% of heart failure cases are caused by HFREF or heart failure with reduced ejection fraction with the balance caused by heart failure with mid-range or preserved ejection fraction. Let's discuss the etiology of heart failure. Coronary artery disease is the underlying etiology in up to 60 to 70% of patients with systolic heart failure. Hypertension and valvular heart disease are significant risk factors for heart failure. Diabetes increases the risk of heart failure twofold by directly leading to cardiomyopathy and significantly contributing to coronary artery disease. Smoking, physical inactivity, obesity, and lower socioeconomic status are other key risk factors. Some key symptoms that we see in heart failure are dyspnea on exertion, orthopnea, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, fatigue, edema, and ankle swelling. Other symptoms will include abdominal bloating and early satiety, exercise intolerance, and cough and wheezing. On physical examination, the patient may show jugular venous distension in the neck an S3 gallop or third heart sound in the heart. The lungs will show labored breathing, rowels, and wheezing. The abdo abdomen will show hepatojugular reflux or ascites. And the extremities will be cool with cyanosis, pallor, and pitting peripheral edema. Here's a diagram of a patient that shows many of the signs and symptoms of heart failure. He has dyspnea, orthopnea, he cannot breathe unless sitting up, cough, and a falling oxygen saturation. He has nausea and vomiting as peristalsis slows and bile and fluids backs up into his stomach. He shows pitting edema, jugular vein distension, and an enlarged spleen and liver from venous congestion. He has anxiety, he's gasping from pulmonary congestion, confused due to decreased oxygen to the brain, and fatigue, and his skin is pale, gray or cyanotic, with a decreased urine output, and a weak pulse, and cool, moist skin. What about laboratory values in heart failure? If a diagnosis of heart failure is suspected, initial testing involves the measurement of natriuretic peptides, electrocardiography, and chest x-ray. B-type natriuretic peptide, or BNP, is a hormone that's produced by the heart. BNP is secreted by the atria and ventricles in response to stretching or increased wall tension. BNP levels increase with age, are higher in women and African Americans, and can be elevated in patients with renal failure. An important thing to note and remember is that BNP levels that are less than 100 picograms per ml usually indicate an absence of heart failure, whereas levels greater than 400 picograms per ml are highly indicative of heart failure. This diagram is key to understanding heart failure and the drugs used to treat it. I will be referring to it multiple times as we move along in this lecture. When the cardiac output decreases in heart failure, it activates the neurohormonal system, stimulating the sympathetic nervous system, the RAS system, and release of other hormones. These resultant effects are compensatory mechanisms to reverse a low blood pressure and low preload. So they initially counteract the decrease in cardiac output. But if continued, as we will see, these effects will cause an eventual worsening of heart failure.
Let's go over each section one at a time. First, we'll talk about the activation of the sympathetic nervous system. A decreased cardiac output leads to activation of the sympathetic or adrenergic nervous system, resulting in increased levels of norepinephrine. The inotropic and chronotropic effects of norepinephrine will maintain cardiac output and perfusion of the vital organs, the brain and the heart. However, this makes the heart work harder and will increase oxygen consumption, causing potential damage to the heart. Vasoconstriction can maintain the blood pressure, but it can also increase the heart's afterload, pressure that the heart pumps against, and thereby worsen the heart failure. Also, chronic exposure to high levels of catecholamines are harmful to the heart because they decrease beta-1 receptor sensitivity and reduce beta-1 receptor density on the surface of myocardial cells. Responsiveness of these receptors can be reduced by 30%. Next, let's talk about the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system, or the RAS system. The production of angiotensin II is significant since it has a number of effects. One, vasoconstriction. By itself, angiotensin II is a potent vasoconstrictor. Angiotensin II is also a potent stimulator of norepinephrine release from the sympathetic nervous system, also causing vasoconstriction. Vasoconstriction can increase afterload and thus be detrimental to heart failure. The second effect of angiotensin II is its neurohormonal effects. Angiotensin II stimulates the adrenal glands to secrete aldosterone, which increases sodium and water reabsorption. Angiotensin II also stimulates the pituitary gland with increasing synthesis and release of antidiuretic hormone, or ADH, or vasopressin, from the pituitary, resulting in the retention of free water in the renal collecting ducts. Increased sodium and water retention increases the preload. These effects favor sodium and water retention, which initially may be beneficial, but in the long term might be detrimental to a worsening heart due to fluid overload. Finally, let's talk a little bit about BMP. As we stated earlier, B-type natriuretic peptide, or BMP, is a natural hormone that's produced by the ventricular myocardium in response to elevations of end diastolic pressure and volume. The net effect of BMP in the body is to cause peripheral and coronary vasodilation, thus decreasing preload and afterload. BMP also has diuretic or natriuretic properties with improved renal blood flow and glomerular filtration resulting from afferent arteriolar dilation. BMP also blocks the effects of aldosterone and vasopressin, so all good things uh, are affected by increased levels of BMP. The favorable effects of BMP can be enhanced by inhibiting neprilysin, the enzyme that degrades BMP, by using a neprilysin inhibitor named Secubitril. So we've now seen how heart failure and a decrease in cardiac output activates the neurohormonal system. At first, the compensatory mechanisms of increasing blood pressure and fluid retention are helpful and beneficial to the body. However, with time, these effects become detrimental and will worsen the heart failure. We can use drugs such as beta blockers to inhibit the sympathetic nervous system and ACE inhibitors, ARBs, and mineraloreceptor antagonists to block the RAS system. More to come in our next installment of heart failure medications. To summarize, we previously defined heart failure and described its epidemiology and prognosis. We listed five key signs and five major symptoms of heart failure. We described what BMP is and identified what value is indicative of heart failure. We explained the influence that the neurohormonal system has on a weakening heart. And we summarized how the sympathetic nervous system, the rest system, and ADH are activated in heart failure and explain the physiologic impact it has on the body. Next up in part two of this series, we will discuss the use of triple drug therapy to treat heart failure and where their antagonism occurs in the neurohormonal system. We'll list the target doses and key side effects when ACE inhibitors and ARBs, beta blockers, and spironolactone are used to treat heart failure. 
will explain the mechanism of the neprilysin inhibitor secubitril and how its addition provides additional benefit based on the paradigm trial. And will list five drug counseling points for valsartan secubitril, known as Entresto, that should be discussed to a patient prescribed the drug. So stay tuned. Thanks for tuning in to watch this installment of the PharmEZ Tutor. I hope you learned something that you could use at school or in practice. If you'd like to continue to see more of these types of tutorials on YouTube, please make sure to click on the subscribe button below to change it from red to gray. Also, if you like this video, I would appreciate it if you can click on the thumbs up icon below to change the color to blue. If you have any comments or questions, please feel free to add them in the comment section below or share this site with someone else. Stay tuned to the Farm Easy Tutor channel for more lectures in the upcoming weeks. So until next time, remember to take it easy.